Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this third event in our series, Geopolitics Beyond Borders. My name is Nilanjan Sarkar. I'm Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Center. And we are delighted to be back uh, along with IISS and LSE Ideas uh, to, to uh, bring together for you another panel and a very interesting uh, discussion that is uh, going to unfold uh, over the next hour and a little more, I'm sure. Uh, before I introduce the panel and say a few words about the event today, uh, I thought I'd mention that uh, the series which we started in Michaelmas term of 2020 um, has had two events already that are available on our website. The first one looked at China's presence in South Asia. The second one at uh, the new dynamics of relations between the United States and different countries of South Asia, especially after the election of President Biden. And the purpose when, when I reached out to uh, IISS, uh, the purpose behind doing this uh, series was that we wanted to look at and discuss from multiple perspectives, different perspectives, um, how the geopolitics, the geostrategy, and the concerns therein, especially of security, but of various other things uh, in the South Asia region was increasingly changing with the presence of um, actors, national actors, traditionally not associated uh, with the region, but who have had increasing influence directly or indirectly. China and the United States were two, um, and there will be others in, in future. But today, uh, I am delighted to uh, discuss uh, a very recently published book uh, about which we're going to hear uh, very soon from the author. And without further ado, uh, I will uh, get on to uh, introducing our panelists. And in uh, a break from my tradition of introducing our panelists and then our collaborator, our, our very, very supportive collaborator from IISS at the end, this time I've decided that I'm going to introduce my collaborator first. Yeah, uh, and because every time I in introduce him at the very end. So it is a huge pleasure for me. Uh, to introduce Rahul Roy Chaudhary, who is Senior Fellow for South Asia at the International Institute for uh, Strategic Studies, that's IISS, as it is more uh, commonly and famously known here in London. Uh, Rahul leads the South Asia Research Program. He's an expert in matters of security and strategy between the different countries of South Asia. Um, and as I said, he uh, and I have collaborated on this from the very beginning. Uh, Rahul has been an enthusiastic supporter. I also want to say that in the five years, more and more, in, we are now in our sixth year, we're getting to our, the end of our sixth year, the South Asia Center. Uh, Rahul has participated in several events of ours, has always been a very great supporter and for which we are very uh, grateful. Um, the event is also part uh, in collaboration with LSE Ideas, uh, which I wanted to mention. Um, Farzana Sheikh is Associate Fellow at Chatham House in London and is an expert on Pakistan and related matters, which of course includes its relationship with India. And Farzana also has uh, definitely attended uh, and several events that, that we have held and, and has been a steadfast supporter of, of the center over the years as we have found our feet. Um, I'm delighted to welcome for the first time uh, Pallavi Raghavan, uh, Dr. Pallavi Raghavan, who has her camera switched off at the moment for reasons of connectivity, and there she is. And we have told her that when the internet connection gets a bit weak, she must switch off the uh, camera. Dr. Pallavi Raghavan is Assistant Professor of International Relations at Ashoka University in India, and has closely studied India-Pakistan relations, and is the author uh, of Animosity at Bay, an alternative history of the India-Pakistan relationship, 1947 to 1952, which was published in 2020. Finally, uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Myra McDonald, uh, who is the author of the book that is the focus of today's discussion, though I'm sure the discussion will go beyond what 
the book alone uh, talks about. But Myra is the author of White as a Shroud, India, Pakistan, and War on the Frontiers of Kashmir, which was published this year in 2021 from Hearst. Uh, Myra is an expert on South Asian politics and security issues and has previously published two very interesting books. Uh, I have to say that of the total of three, I have read two. I've read the one that's being discussed today and I've read the first one. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, the first one was in Heights of Madness, which was uh, published in 2007, which was on the Siachen. And Defeat is an Orphan, How Pakistan Lost the Great South Asian War, which was published in 2017. What we have decided is that we will invite Myra to make some initial comments uh, to talk about the, the, the book that is uh, the focus of today's discussion and to also lay out other issues that she may want to. Uh, and then we will invite uh, the discussants, uh, the panelists to speak. Uh, and Rahul will then take over. Uh, um, uh, Pallavi is going to speak first, Farzana is going to speak second, and then Rahul will take over and we'll have a discussion. Those of you who are watching the live stream on YouTube, uh, you are very welcome to ask questions in the chat function of YouTube, and I will at regular and irregular intervals butt in to pose those questions if you would like to. You're also welcome to make comments. Uh, we will only pose the questions. Um, you are welcome to pose questions to a single panelist. You're also welcome to pose questions to the panel as a whole if you would like if you have a general question, you'd like everyone's, everyone's views on the matter. I'm not an expert on the subject, so I'm not going to speak uh, very much. Um, you are welcome to tweet and tag us. Our Twitter handle is at SAsiaLSC. And without further ado, I'm now going to invite Myra to make her opening remarks. Myra, over to you if you speak for about eight minutes. Thank you. Well, good, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to say before I begin my, my remarks is that I'm aware this event is overshadowed by the COVID crisis. And while I don't really have time to talk about the implications of, of it here, I don't want to ignore it either. So I should extend my sympathies to everybody caught up in it and to everybody here indeed who's got family and friends in, in India. Now, I've been given eight minutes to speak, which is very brief for someone who's written a book. Um, so I'm just going to limit myself to some, some broad headlines, which I hope um, paves the way for, for discussion. Uh, let me start by, with a little bit of context. Um, my latest book, I've very much focused on Ladakh, which, as many of you will know, is the, um, the largest but the least populated uh, part of the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir and I would argue the most strategically important. It draws a lot on the book I published years ago on the Siachen War, the world's highest war, fought at the point where India, Pakistan and China meet. But I've drawn it out to look more broadly at all the military demarcation lines around Ladakh. In other words, the line of control between India and Pakistan, the Siachen front line, and the line of actual control between India and China. And I think it's important to stress because not a lot of people who, who, who realize if you don't know the region, the extent to which these are now really becoming an interlinked chain around Ladakh. Um, to the extent that you can't really talk about one, for example, the LOC without talking about the LAC on the other hand. Uh, by way of big picture background, I would stress that this is a region of multiple overlapping con uh, conflicts. You have borders or frontiers or military demarcation lines which have never been agreed. And to remind you all, um, just last year um, on the line of actual control between India and China in northeastern Ladakh, uh, we saw the deadliest clashes uh, between Indian and Chinese soldiers in more than five decades. So that just gives you an idea of how volatile it is. But on top of these frontier conflicts, you also have contestations between local populations and their central governments. So do bear in mind always that Ladakh is surrounded by, on one side, Xinjiang, um, on another, Tibet, and then on the other, the Kashmir Valley. 
Um, on top of those, you have the regional contestation between India, China, and Pakistan, with India in a rivalry with both both China and Pakistan, and Pakistan and China developing an increasingly uh, growing alliance. And finally, as if that's not enough, then do please add increasing tension between the United States and China. And you begin to see how important it is to understand this region. I'll say a very few words about where we are now, just to kick us off for discussion. The India-Pakistan relationship, to my mind, is looking a little bit better, or at least less bad than it has done for quite a few years. Uh, they have agreed a ceasefire on the line, or to renew a ceasefire on the line of control. I do think both countries have an interest in managing the relationship better, at least for now. From the Indian side, um, I would say, particularly since all the tensions on the border with, with China, it increasingly faces a challenge on two fronts, one on the front with China and one on the front with, with Pakistan. And that challenge exists whether you go to the kind of extreme fears of a two-front war or even at the current level where India is having to face highly overstretched resources in terms of mili military deployment on both those demarcation lines. Um, so it has an interest in, 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 in improving or re reducing tensions with either Pakistan or China or both. On the Pakistan side, and one reason, well, two reasons I think it has an interest in, 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 um, in pursuing talks um, with India right now, and I'm not going into the economy here, I'm aware of that as other being an issue, but just in terms of defense and territorial issues. Um, first of all, Pakistan has to deal with the fallout of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. And secondly, um, and importantly for, for my part of the world, is neighboring Ladakh is Gilgit Baltistan, which is increasingly important to Pakistan as its only land bridge with, 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 in, with China. And it's through Gilgit Baltistan that the Chinese Pakistan Economic Corridor that is meant to connect Xinjiang with Pakistani ports on the Arabian Sea runs. Now, India formally claims Gilgit Baltistan as part of erstwhile Jammu and Kashmir. Um, I can envisage a scenario, and there have been hints of it on and off over previous years, where Pakistan would like a little bit more security over its, its, its actions in Gilgit Baltistan um, in order to underpin that um, China-Pakistan economic corridor thereby adding to its interest in having a slightly better relationship with India right now. Um, on the China front, uh, the tensions on the border um, really seem to have created a kind of rupture in the India-China relationship. And I think and one thing I try to draw out a bit on my book is the extent to which frontier tensions both reflect and exacerbate broader antagonisms at the national level. And we're seeing increasingly a deterioration in the, the trading and economic relationship between India and China, which was until relatively recently insulated from the dispute over the border. So I would say that is probably, if anything, almost more worrying than the India-Pakistan front now because in combination with rising antagonism between the US and China, what we're seeing between India and China is actually quite new, thereby making it much harder to, to understand and figure out a roadmap out of it. Now, finally, and I'm just gonna make one general observation, uh, which is really drawing on a lot of the research I did, including on the ground in Siachen, but on on all of the military deployment in these, these frontiers is that, I mean, if you know that part of the world, you, 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 you begin to understand the extent to which military deployment there is, is inherently escalatory. 
I mean, you can see that in history. It's if you take all the, the demarcation lines I've looked at, including the line of control, it is it is a place where so many deployments have had unintended consequences. Whether you include the original Indian deployment in Siachen or Pakistan starting the Cargill War in 1999, um, it's also, I think, looking at the geography. If you see the, the the immensity of that landscape, I mean, the highest mountains in the world, these vast cold deserts, um, it's quite difficult to have any kind of stability in uh, in military deployment because um, you're so stretched that the other side will always be looking to try and probe um, and take advantage of any of your any of your weaknesses. Um, and so what happens is armies might start with a small number of troops and then sprawl outwards. And what tends to happen is you see, for example, you set up one high position and from that high position, inevitably, there'll be another high position that looks like you need it to defend it. Or you'll decide you need other military positions to defend your flanks. Um, so the army sprawl outwards. On top of that, and I have argued in my book that we've seen a little bit of this on the LAC between India and China, you build a road to supply your troops on the front line. That road needs to be defended. You build an airstrip. The airstrip needs to be defended. You set up a military post to defend the road, and before you know it, you're setting up another military post to defend that military post. So as I said, very inher inherently <coughs> escalatory. And on top of that, you have soldiers deployed in really harsh terrain, often at high altitude, not as high as in Siachen, but even the many parts of the line of actual control are high enough to be disorientating. You can often be in terrible weather, harsh conditions, uh, far away from uh, <coughs> senior commanders in, in capital cities. So it's an environment very you know, ripe for miscalculation. So I would say just to sum up, uh, we need to be looking at interlinked and overlapping conflicts right from the micro level where I say that tactical maneuvering on the frontiers means you can very easily get caught up in a situation where tactics drives uh, strategy rather than the other way around. <clears throat> but then from the, the micro level at the frontiers, local contestations, as for example, Tibet, Xinjiang, and Kashmir, regional contestations, um, India, Pakistan, China, and finally US, China. <clears throat> it really is very difficult, incredibly tangled knot that will take a lot of care and patience to untangle. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Myra, very much. I'm sure that uh, there will be opportunity for you to speak again about the book as, as the discussion gets on. I notice on, on um, YouTube that a lot of people have joined uh, since you started to speak. So before I invite Pallavi to, to speak, I just thought that I would introduce her once again for those who might have joined later and did not hear my introduction. Dr. Pallavi Raghavan is Assistant Professor of International Relations at Ashoka University in India and has closely studied India-Pakistan relations and is the author most recently of Animosity at Bay, an alternative history of the India-Pakistan relationship, 1947-1952. It was published in 2020. Pallavi, if you speak now, you have about eight minutes. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much, Nilanjan, for your kind introduction. Uh, you know, what I am going to do is just to be on the safe side. I am going to turn my camera off again because I think uh, you know uh, it's a it's a shaky net connection. So I, you know, just to be on the safe side and just to make sure I don't get cut off. Cut off. I'm just gonna uh, you know just gonna speak into the computer. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for having me and uh, for letting me be a part of this panel. And thank you to Myra, Myra for writing such a, uh, such a vivid and grounded and compassionate description of the realities of and demands of war and war making in, in, in South Asia. And, you know, can I just begin by saying that, look, you know, it was also, I mean, 
sort of sitting in Delhi right now, which is in the midst of this, this terrible kind of, uh, you know, terrifying kind of uh, situation. It was also, you know, it was, it was, it was also a really, you know, um, welcome for me to kind of read your book and this kind of uh, uh, escape that it kind of provided uh, away from, you know, the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation at the present. And one of the things I kind of thought about when I was reading it was that, you know, considering the amount of trouble and expense and 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 you know effort uh, that both these armies spend on kind of maintaining their grip on these very very inhospitable and uh, distant kind of uh, climates. Uh, I mean, one of the things I thought about was you know I wish they'd just go to half that trouble in in, in kind of expenditure on health and education. You know, I mean, the, I mean it, the, the the reality of that kind of uh, came home particularly um, you know as, as strongly as I was reading. Uh, reading your account um and you know it's i mean uh, for me like I, I think the other panelists are going to uh, kind of probably get into a discussion about the minutiae of the twists and turns of the Kargil war in the 1990s and 1980s but for me as a historian i just wanted to kind of uh, take a step back and uh, uh, talk about how you know your, your book also you know one of the things that it kind of uh, you know uh, uh, brought out particularly clear was the challenges that people face when they're trying to uh, kind of bang into shape regions that are simply that simply aren't designed to kind of be easily slotted into a territorial nation state definition of how uh, uh, you know of a, of a modern state and what, uh, one of the things I enjoyed particularly while reading your book you know is this 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 uh, you know prehistory that you offered like the older longer 19th century Great game history uh, of, of you know of of Kash, you know of Kashmir of this kind of you know this this hub this trade hub uh, with the easy sense of cosmopolitanism that was used to kind of doing business with all kinds of different empires and jurisdictions and localities and 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 you know uh, 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 sort of uh, sovereignties um, and this 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 place that was you know populated people by kind of caravan caravan trades and 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 wool traders and you know that kind of place with that kind of history to kind of uh, push it into a, a state jacket of a nation state you know a territorially defined nation state uh, you know one of the things that this book kind of brings out is the challenges that you're going to encounter along the way uh, when you when you try to do it to you know when you try to um, when you you know when you try to do that um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just thought I'd, I, I'd talk a little bit about, you know, how your book kind of brings out the history and geography of, of, of this, uh, of this uh, you know, of, of the Siachen Glacier and uh, of this terrain. And I, you know, I, I also just enjoyed reading, you know, the, the prose of the book is, is and it's a really well written account of like the uh, you know the, the granular everyday kind of lived reality of the climate you know and what it kind of feels like just to be in that place this cold harsh bleak white unrelenting uh, kind of place where you know it, it takes you know you you take a couple of days just to kind of get used to the you know the, the altitude uh, you can't breathe uh, you know when you get there uh, first you can't think straight uh, and I, you know I, I i mean i thought the book was also particularly you know, it, it, it brought out the, the, the scale of the challenge, you know, the, the sheer uh, enormity of, of the challenge of, of, of trying to maintain a toehold in, in that kind of, uh, you know, in that kind of uh, terrain. Um, and uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, thing I found interesting about the book was that it also, I think, I mean, I think the causal story that the book is really trying to tell is one about cartography. I mean, you know, what, what, what comes across in, in, in from this account is, 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 you know, the causal explanation about the nature of India-Pakistan relations being the way that they are is to do with an anxiety about boundary lines, you know, and, and maps. And that, 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 that what's going on right now, you know, what's going, what happened in Siachen over, 
you know over the 90s and 80s and uh, you know in the in the 40s uh, was to do with a, a, a sense of anxiety by india and pakistan about uh, you know um, uh, which was really i mean it wasn't really about uh, 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 you know it wasn't really linked to a sense of identity you know the, the reason that they was that they were so uh, 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 determined to, to to retain this uh, you know uh, uh, it, it was to do with the sense uh, with the, you know i mean uh, when you talk to kind of soldiers who who uh, who served there uh, one of the things that they say is that you know uh, and you ask them look what were you thinking why did you go there you know what is it all for and they don't say that look i felt like my identity of this religion or that language or you know something like that was was under attack instead i felt that this particular piece of land shouldn't go to somebody else because it belongs to us and the way in which we are defined as a nation state is really to do with how our maps have to hold together you know and there's a sense in which a uh, 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 sense of nationality uh, hinges is almost, you know, what comes across uh, from the book is that it, it, it's uh, very deeply linked with, with our sense of maps, you know, almost to the extent of kind of overriding other things, you know, I mean, I would have thought that, okay, fine, it's, it could be religion, or it could be language, or it could, I don't know, it could be anything, any, any number of identity based calculations that are forcing these armies to, to, to engage in this particular terrain over so many years. But instead, uh, you know, what they say is that, look, we don't want our uh, territory to go into some somebody else's land you know, to, to, to go into somebody uh, to go to somebody else so i thought you know uh, 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 at the end of the day for me what the book really brought home was the incredibly fragile uh, sense uh, or a claim that nationalism kind of uh, you know in india and pakistan really uh, uh, makes uh, and the way in which it, it hinges on you know on, on, on simply a map rather than any other uh, sense of identity kind of uh, driving it along. And, uh, you know, if your nationalism is, is to be uh, defined in such a very fragile way, then, uh, you know, uh, what will happen is that you, you're going to have states that are going to be that much more insecure and that much more prone to hostility and warfare. Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop here, but I just wanted to end by saying again, uh, thank you again for providing us this really rich and, and vivid account of, of, of the Siachen Basin. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, Pallavi. And I'm sure uh, we'll come back to you at some point. Uh, may I once again introduce uh, Farzana Sheikh, who's Associate Fellow at Chatham House in London and is an expert on Pakistan and related matters, which includes uh, Pakistan's relationship with India. I also want to say that when uh, I invited Farzana um, to speak um, at this event, um, she mentioned to me that um, she had read the book already and was one of the endorsers of, of the book. Uh, and I uh, did everything I could to convince her that that only qualified her more to participate in this panel discussion rather than less to participate in this panel discussion. So Farzana, we are very, very happy and privileged to have you. Please speak now. Thank you. Thank you, Nilanjan. Well, I'd like to start really by formally thanking you and of course, Rahul Rao Choitri for inviting me to, to speak at this event. Uh, prompted by the publication of uh, Myra's important new book on the battle over Siachen in the high Himalayas. It's really been a privilege for me to hear Myra tell us more about this little known conflict that has threatened to merge with other deadly struggles in the region and which have kept its three nuclear powers, India, Pakistan and China locked in confrontation for more than four decades. Uh, fortunately, Pallavi is here to remind us that expressions of violence and hostility in the region have not precluded acts of cooperation in the past. Indeed, India, Pakistan and China have all at times demonstrated their capacity to negotiate and resolve differences. And while the issue of Kashmir has proved to be particularly intractable, sparking three major wars between uh, India and Pakistan. Uh, it is, I think, still worth recalling that both countries were once also engaged in pursuing a no-war pact. Now, as we know, its prospects soon withered, leaving India and Pakistan to pay a heavy price for its collapse. But nowhere have the costs of this failure been more brutally exposed than in Siachen, where the merciless fury of a frozen wasteland has taken more lives 
than the fighting between two enemies. A struggle of two bald men over a comb is how Steve Gowan, a US specialist in South Asia, once described the war between India and Pakistan in the frigid peaks around Sechen. The implication being that the conflict was militarily unimportant, a mere sideshow to the main event, which was the conflict in the Valley of Kashmir. But as Myra demonstrates in her book, this assumption is now really wide open to question. For not only did the war in Siachen come to be closely tied to the confrontation across the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir after Pakistan's misadventure in Kargil in 1999, which aimed to force the withdrawal of Indian troops from Siachen, but it now also extends to the line of actual control on the eastern fringes of Kashmir's Ladakh region. China's reinforced military presence in the Galwan Valley, which led to fierce clashes with Indian forces in May 2020, is widely seen to threaten the movement of Indian troops and supplies to Siachen. What binds these conflicts or these three conflicts together, however, is the element of miscalculation. Like the war in Siachen, the speed and ferocity of the conflict in Kargil in 1999 and more recently in Eastern Ladakh took many by surprise, not least the parties most directly involved in the conflict. So in the few minutes I have left, I'd like to widen this discussion by touching on three main issues. The first is the risk of an accidental war involving South Asia's three nuclear powers. For it has been clear since at least 1999 that expectations of restraint attached to the status of India, Pakistan and China as nuclear powers can no longer be justified given their readiness to use military force to settle disputes. If so, we must be prepared for a war on the frontiers of Kashmir developing into a full-blown regional crisis with the devastating consequences. One important conclusion of Myra's study of the Siachen conflict, I thought, was precisely to confirm how a series of innocuous moves by one party in a highly volatile neighborhood can easily be read or misread as signs of belligerence by another. Who would have thought that the carelessness of a US mapping agency in the 1970s, which inadvertently placed the Siachen Glacier in Pakistani territory, would nudge Pakistan to revive its tourist industry by inviting in foreign mountaineers to scale local peaks, only to have its actions denounced by India as, quote, cartographic aggression and grounds for war. Today, Siachen stands as a sober reminder of the lethal consequences of accidental war in South Asia, which still remains a global concern. In April this year, the US National Intelligence Committee in its Global Trends Report warned, not for the first time, that miscalculation by India and Pakistan could lead them to, quote, stumble into a large scale war that neither side wanted. It also warned of the danger of India and China slipping into a war that neither intended, especially if, quote, military forces escalate a conflict quickly to challenge each other on a critical part of their contested border. This brings me to my second point, which is to evaluate the conflict in Siachen as the extension of a much wider contestation for power between India, Pakistan and China, informed by the fear of strategic encirclement. As Myra observes, It was the fear of a potential link up between Pakistan and China on the northern fringes of Ladakh that drove India to occupy Siachen in 1984, sparking a military confrontation with Pakistan. 
That in turn was rooted in earlier Indian anxieties of encirclement following a controversial 1963 border agreement between Pakistan and China, which ceded control to China over the Shakskam tract adjacent to the Siachen Glacier. The threat, real or imagined, of encirclement continues to inform perceptions and shape policies in the region. In 2020, China's actions in the Galvan Valley were widely cast as an attempt by China to hem in Indian forces on the Siachen Glacier by staging a two-front war involving Pakistan to the west and China to the east. Pakistan itself, of course, is no stranger to the fear of encirclement, although those fears are directed at India rather than China. There is perhaps no better example of this than Pakistan's Afghan policy, which has long been geared to keep India out of Afghanistan and preempt the risk of a pincer movement in the event of war. My final point is to call attention to the somewhat distinctive nature of defending territorial borders in post-colonial South Asia, where the urge to settle cartographic ambiguities by military means is used to resolve long-standing anxieties about national identity. Nowhere is this more amply demonstrated than in the exceptionally disputed regions of the once princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. The culturally highly diverse and home to a significant Hindu and Buddhist population, it is the region's Muslim majority that has emerged as the principal object to test rival definitions of national identity espoused by India and Pakistan. It is, I think, beyond tragic that India's self-professed secular identity and Pakistan's claim to be home to a separate Muslim nation have both required validation by Muslim Kashmir, leaving its people and the people of South Asia hostage to an enduring conflict. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Farzana Sheikh, uh, Dr. Pallavi Raghavan, and Myra, of course, uh, uh, for starting off this discussion. Uh, I, I think I firstly, what I want to do for those who haven't seen the cover of the book is to actually show you the, the book cover. This is uh, Myra's bestseller, uh, I, I would argue. And if you uh, haven't uh, read it uh, before, by all means, please uh, do so. And uh, it is available and easy uh, to acquire. Uh, like the uh, other uh, two, the last two panelists, I'd like to join uh, the Myra fan club, <laughs> as I say, and uh, and say that when I read the book, I was deeply impressed uh, by the book, and I was impressed by a number of factors. But I think the most important one is the one that actually Dr. Pallavi Raghavan uh, mentioned. That is Myra's uh, compassionate perspective towards the conflict, uh, having uh, traveled intensely on both sides of the line of control uh, in Siachen, uh, being hosted by both the Indian and the Pakistani uh, militaries. And I think that sense of compassion uh, really comes out uh, tremendously. And I think it's, it's, it's wonderful uh, to, to have, have, have read uh, the book by Myra. I mean, it's not the first of Myra's books I read, but but definitely the most impressive one uh, so far. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the discussion, as the moderator, I think it is my responsibility to challenge uh, both the author and the panelists. And uh, I have sort of two or three areas in which I'd like to uh, do this before we open up uh, to uh, others uh, through a Q&A uh, and chat session. And the first uh, uh, issue I have is, is the one that, that, that all three have actually spoken about in different ways. And I think uh, one couldn't agree more that it was an accidental conflict. In fact, uh, on uh, page uh, 88 of uh, Myra's book, uh, she writes of a conversation with uh, the Lieutenant General retired uh, Manohar Chibber, who was the Director General of Military Operations in 1978, uh, when the first Indian military expedition to Siachen took place. And, and uh, he tells uh, Myra that 
uh, that uh, it was not something, and I'm quoting from the book, it was not something deliberately planned by them, the Pakistanis or by us, uh, he told me, she writes, I still believe the whole thing was precipitated by a very enterprising travel agent. And the reason for this, uh, uh, Myra uh, uh, tells us, is that uh, the, his view was, General Chibbers, that the travel agent was hoping <clears throat> to make money from foreign mountaineers keen to explore the Siachen region. <clears throat> so I think it's, there is no doubt in my mind <clears throat> that it was accidental. And I think there's a lot of uh, historical uh, narratives and evidence uh, of, uh, to substantiate that, including Myra's book. But the question I have is the one that the Myra raised and uh, Dr. Uh, Frazana Sheikh also raised, is the escalatory nature <clears throat> of, of this conflict. Uh, Myra talked about uh, the interlink interlinked and overlapping conflict that Siachen has in relation to the other conflicts in the region and uh, concern that uh, tactically uh, it, would, it would, could increase in scope, size, and of course the, the ramifications not only as India, Pakistan, but China as well. But I'd like to challenge that. I'd like to do that by going back to all three uh, panelists uh, because my sense is, is, is slightly different and that is from the book. I mean, another thing that comes out clearly uh, is, is the landscape, <clears throat> the tough terrain <clears throat> that Myra uh, describes very well, uh, the freezing cold weather conditions, the logistics challenge, the sheer challenge of getting people you know, onto uh, Siachia, the Saltoro Ridge, uh, 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 Myra's own helicopter uh, journeys where uh, she says that her mind doesn't work fully and, and she becomes a risk taker <laughs> to the extent that the Indian pilots are also very wary of, of carrying Myra in, in, in the helicopter uh, because she wants to go further and further and higher and higher. Uh, the deaths that have taken place, uh, not only in terms of the conflict, uh, but also natural death, uh, the, the, the nature, the crevices, uh, the, the, you know, the temperature, uh, et cetera, the, high, the low temperatures. So the question I'd like to pose to the, the panel really is how escalatory can the Siachen conflict really become? Uh, because to me, there will always be limits. I mean, how much, you know, how many troops, how many, what equipment, uh, the logistic support. I mean, there will be a limit uh, to what you can actually deploy. Uh, escalatory in geographical terms, maybe in terms of, uh, of China, the Xianjiang, well, that remains to be seen, I think. So the question I'd like to pose to all uh, the three panelists, and I want to start with uh, Myra and then uh, Dr. Palavi Raghavan and then Dr. Farzana Sheikh, is this question. Uh, how uh, escalatory do you think uh, the Siachen conflict really is in today's condition? Myra. Right, so I would answer that by saying that, I mean, Siachen per se is not necessarily escalatory, but it's the implications of, of holding on to Siachen. And I point to two, two areas. Um, I mean, Siachen doesn't, when it started, it was, it was in, 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 the, in the passes over the Saltoro range, but the, 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 the extent of the, the, the front line um, got longer and longer until it was all but touching the line of control um, uh, between India and Pakistan, the formal delineated line of control. And so while you may say that Siachen itself is not escalatory, the fact is that it did reach to the point where Pakistan had an interest in um, what Musharraf called at the time in his ghostwritten memoirs, military maneuvers against India in that part of the world, which was his justification for the Kargil War. And you know, there are lots of arguments about why Pakistan started the Kargil War, but certainly Siachen played into it. <clears throat> and we all know that that did have a serious risk of escalation. On the other side, coming to the northeastern side, the line of actual control between India and China, um, what you see is people are people saying, uh, India can't possibly consider any kind of pullback from, for example, the Depsine Plains, um, because it needs to use that to prevent Siachen from being cut off. Um, it has built a road uh, to Dalat Belg, Aldi to 
uh, to supply an airstrip, which is right next to the area abutting both the Shatskam Tract and Siachen Glacier. The confrontation in the Galwan Valley last year was presented to some extent as based on a need to defend that road. Uh, I can see no, um, not even a real tactical gain otherwise in India fighting for uh, um, uh, the position, the mountain ledge that it did fight for in the Galwan Valley. Um, and we have then seen that these are little tactical maneuvers in the mountains, but look at where the India economic and trade relationship, the India-China economic and trade relationship is now. And that's where I say you get, not Siachen per se, but you actually get these, these, these sort of chain reactions that eat, whether to trade between India and China on one side or the cargo war between India and Pakistan on the other, it's the way, it, it's the ripple effect that makes it so dangerous rather than the immediate conflict per se. Oh, thank you, uh, my, uh, Dr. Raghavan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. For, uh, thank you for the question. And you know, I, I, I think I basically want to end up echoing what uh, what Mayra just said in terms of how these things escalate, as far as uh, how it's it's you know it's it, it's like a flashpoint. It's not the cause of the conflict only, but it, it, it's at at moments in which the broader kind of history of uh, the broader kind of uh, you know setting of india pakistan relations as a whole uh, also uh, kind of encourages uh, building up a conflict in in, in this particular uh, kind of area you know so so it's not uh, i mean I, I, I would go the other way it's not siachen causing the conflict it's how much is the relationship as a whole causing uh, you know uh, things to escalate in in siachen uh, i also wanted to kind of uh, you know uh, if i could just uh, uh, quickly uh, you know uh, talk about how you know in 1948 uh, there, I mean, you know, the, the, the locale is different, you know, and the, and the people concerned are different, and I'm not talking about exactly the same thing, but in 1948, there is a war in Kash over Kashmir, you know, and there is a war, there is a mil military confrontation between India and Pakistan uh, over Kashmir, um, uh, which, you know, uh, which could, uh, after all, you know, conceivably take on the same, uh, you know, a, a big international dimensions, you know, we're, we're talking about the same locality. Uh, but at the same time, what happened in 1948 was that there was also an attempt by the leadership of both countries to try to look for uh, alternative avenues for uh, you know for co co coexistence and, and and dialogue. I mean, so in the even while there was a, every reason for a conflict to kind of flare up, which it did, uh, yet there was also a kind of inbuilt mechanism in there, which also allowed for the leadership of India and Pakistan to 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 look for other you know other other ways of thinking about how they could handle the conflict. So in in terms of the question of look, uh, how much does this escalate? I mean, I think it depends depends on the leadership, you know, and, and what they want to do with the relationship as a whole. Uh, the, the, the cause, you know, the, the, the nature of the uh, uh, dispute is sort of constant, but how it plays out in different decades depends on the, the overall relationship. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, Dr. Farzana Sheikh. And uh, Dr. Farzana Sheikh, you have to uh, unmute yourself. You unmute. Uh, you have to un yes yes please go ahead um, yes I, I I would agree I don't think it's it's a question of of escalation so much as what both Myra and 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 Pallavi have emphasized as a Siachen serving as the trigger and as a flashpoint in an extremely volatile uh, neighborhood uh, I mean that's 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 really that's really uh, the nub of the problem uh, uh, aside from that of course as, as Myra says and she made an important point uh, that that you know the the, the CHN frontier now sort of virtually merges with 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 the line of control between India and Pakistan I mean all that area uh, it, which uh, of, of which you know uh, she, she she talks about in her book is so poorly demarcated, but it it is a question of these undemarcated frontiers feeding uh, into into each other, uh, and and uh, you know uh, 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 a fairly limited though brutal conflict 
feeding into a much wider uh, contestation. I mean, that that is that is really um, the risk. I think from Pakistan's point of view, uh, it's also a question of, of perceptions. I mean, you know, we, we've, we've, had, we've had attempts to, 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 to settle the conflict uh, in Siachen, and Mara knows better than most that these attempts at coming to some kind of, of, of negotiated solution uh, to, 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 to bring the temperature down, in a manner of speaking, in Siachen have not really worked. But to the extent that Siachen is perceived in Pakistan as an extension of the Kashmir conflict. And to the extent, and Myra develops this very well in her book, um, it's seen as part of that territory. Uh, there is this, this, this problem of one party uh, or perhaps both parties wanting to dig in their heels and refusing to cede even one inch of territory. I mean, that's, that's a refrain that, that, that runs right through through Myra's book, we're not going to cede one inch of territory. What a very different approach to frontiers and borders uh, that, that, that this is compared to the way uh, the British uh, handled it. And, and Myra again develops this very nicely in her book where you know they were at ease with, with sort of keeping um, uh, what they called buffer zones. Uh, you know, loose, loosely demarcated regions. But, you know, as I said in my own presentation, I mean, these cartographic ambiguities are, are, are no longer sustainable, and particularly not when there, 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 there is so much uncertainty uh, and, 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 and contestation over questions of nationalism and national identity. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sheikh. In fact, that uh, brings up uh, another question uh, that I have. Uh, uh, before I turn over to Dr. Sarkar. And uh, this is a question that actually uh, has been sent to me by another expert on Kashmir, uh, Victoria Schofield, uh, whom we all know uh, very well. And uh, Victoria's question, which I'll read out to you just now, uh, actually is, is, is sort of fully relevant to what Dr. Sheikh uh, ended with. And, and Victoria's question is this. Uh, she was wondering whether uh, the panelists think uh, they uh, the, that the, whether the, what the prospects were for the resumption of talks relating to uh, Siachen, especially picking up from where both India and Pakistan were in 1989. And I think this also relates to what uh, Myra said was uh, a slightly better situation, uh, bit political environment between India and Pakistan uh, over the renewal of the ceasefire on the line of control uh, in February. Uh, and uh, Victoria's question continues that uh, as we know, uh, during Benazir Bhutto's first administration, when Rajiv Gandhi visited Pakistan, substantive talks were held and they almost reached agreement. What hope is there of returning to these negotiating positions? Let me put this question first to Myra and then uh, Dr. Raghavan and Dr. Sheikh, and then uh, I'll turn over to Dr. Nilanja Sarkar. Uh, Myra. Okay, so I start with a positive um, on the broader India-Pakistan picture. Uh, I mean, one thing, we have seen, as you all know, progress on peace talks between India and Pakistan before. We got quite far between um, Musharraf and Manmohan Singh around 2006. I always thought one of the problems of those talks was that Musharraf was very much acting alone. Now, I've only heard this secondhand, but if it's true, I understand that Bajwa is actually briefing more people now about the nature of the talks, not about the nature of the talks, but about the need for talks with India and for a compromise with India. I mean, he seems to be briefing senior media anchors, talking to his officers. That is something that Musharraf <coughs> singularly failed to do. So if we see, I mean, that's one thing I, I think is really important to look for is whether we see any, any shift in the in the, in the consensus or in, in, the, 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 in the view of elite public opinion um, towards some kind of compromise with India over Kashmir, um, that would make a big difference in moving forward. Um, On the specific question of, of Siachen, um, I, 
you know, it, it is a terrible mess now. You, 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 it's very hard, as I've argued in my book, to withdraw from Siachen now uh, without also having an agreement on the line of control because you, you would then leave the, the north uh, eastern end of the line of control vulnerable if you pull the troops out from Siachen. Um, and it's equally difficult for India to pull out of Siachen because part of that is now kind of almost propping up its, its other contestation with, with China in, in the, the Deep Sand Plains. So I don't see any immediate opportunity for a mutual withdrawal from Siachen. Um, so I'm neg ne pessimistic about that, but I'm a little bit more optimistic than I've been for a while on the broader India-Pakistan thing. If we see any real commitment for some kind of sustained back channel talks that are that are are widened out enough to get other people on on board with it, so that it actually can last. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raghavan. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the for the question. And again, like I'm, I, you know, I myself am not necessarily the most qualified kind of person to be able to uh, to be able to offer any convincing kind of uh, argument about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in, and, and 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 predict you know the the, the next uh, coming years of the Kashmir conflict, uh, you know, and the India-Pakistan relationship as a whole. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, you know, what the exact details of like a resolution or a compromise, uh, you know, uh, to, you know, would look like in the future like i'm not sure about the minutiae of it but not it's also i mean again like it's you know what uh, what i is i find quite uh, striking is that uh, you know the, the first five years if i could just take you back to my partition are so very instructive for precisely this reason is that you know you you you, you you're really it looks like you've hit rock bottom you know this is that it's that it's that the worst sort of happened you know after partition the millions of uh, you know the millions of people displaced the hundreds of thousands of people killed uh, you know the the sheer feeling of of being wronged and, 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 and negativity and hostility on either side over partition. I mean, I don't think you, in the decades that followed, I don't think you saw anything to the, of, that, of that scale. Um, and it's, it's precisely in that, that period, you know, the first time there was this very bitter landscape as far as uh, the bitterness associated with partition. It's out of that to uh, a peacemaking between India and Pakistan. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's not like the, it's impossible. And it's not as if, you know, the, the leadership on, on either side don't, don't recognize the value of doing it. And, you know, it, 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 so it's, it's uh, you know, when you're looking for, you know, uh, how is it that compromise or, 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 or negotiation is achieved, it's also about uh, uh, trying to think about, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 trying to kind of uh, contextualize the present moment against that much worse moment of 1947, when a sub amount of movement was possible, you know, so I mean, I would kind of contextualize the scale of the challenge against the, the partition moment. Thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, Dr. Farzana Sheikh, please. Uh, thank you. I, uh, there was a, a little dip in my internet connection, but I, I, I assume that the question really related to um, um, the talk about talks, uh, which is uh, the best way one can describe it. Um, I think, uh, I mean, my own position is that really the jury is is out there. Uh, I don't believe that we have grounds yet uh, for optimism. Um, it is it is unclear uh, both uh, from uh, the Pakistani side as well as from the Indian side whether this is simply uh, a, a short term 
tactical move. Uh, obviously, uh, India is concerned about uh, about um, its its, um, its its volatile front with China. It it clearly wants to keep uh, keep things on an even keel by not allowing the situation to degenerate. On both sides, uh, on both the east and the, uh, and the west, uh, as uh, as for Pakistan, uh, we all know that uh, its its economy is in very poor shape, uh, and that uh, you know it has come to understand, or at least some sections of the ruling military uh, and political establishment have come to understand that uh, you know uh, continuing uh, to, to 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 spend such. The higher levels on on defense uh, has had uh, you know has had a very damaging effect on the economy. Um, my own feeling is really that again from the Pakistani side, um, we are already uh, beginning to see some element of skepticism creep in. There is a feeling, and this feeling has grown over the last week or so, uh, about the lack of any kind of reciprocity or response, um, however feeble, uh, from, uh, from the Indian side. Now, everybody knows that these are back-channel talks and that you know a, a public statement would not perhaps uh, be appropriate. Nevertheless, uh, there are many doubters uh, in uh, in Pakistan, uh, doubters who um, have been led to believe that perhaps India uh, is not, uh, after all, so serious about these talks and that it is merely playing for time. I think the most important thing um, where, where, where Pakistan is concerned, if there is to be any kind of agreement, however fragile between India and Pakistan, is who is going to sell this politically to the people. Uh, and, and, and that's a big issue because all the signs are that the uh, ruling political dispensation is deeply divided uh, on, on, on uh, these, uh, these talks. It's also not clear to what extent Bajwa himself uh, has been able to establish a consensus within that core group of, of, of core commanders. We thought that Musharraf had his core commanders on side only to realize uh, some time later that in fact, it was a deeply divided uh, leadership at at that level. So I would I would still tend to err on the side of caution and and would refrain from from raising my hopes very high at this stage. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sheikh. I mean, I would have loved to continue with my moderating role, but unfortunately, uh, Dr. Sarkar has given me the chop, and he has multiple questions for all of you from uh, others. So I I will now. Uh, pass over to Dr. Sarkar. Thank you very much, Rahul. It's, uh, thank you very much. This was wonderful. And if we have time later on, Rahul, you will regain your throne of moderator and continue with this. I have absolutely no doubt. And I'll be very happy to, to, to agree to that. Uh, we have quite a few questions. And to those who are posing the questions, who can see each other's questions, uh, you will know and see that I'm going to try and ask them as faithfully as I can. However, uh, for bearing in mind the question of time, also bearing in mind relevance, I will pick and choose parts that are relevant. Uh, the only bit that I'm going to leave out is there, there are two questions in three parts. One, two questions from one person, one is a comment, and then another question from someone else, uh, which relate really to the, the change in uh, the status of Jammu and Kashmir uh, from the side of the government of India, the abrogation of Article 370, and the other uh, things that happened in, in uh, 2019, um, Article 35A, um, which I am not posing to the panel. This is this I'm saying for the benefit of the audience and those who have asked the question, because that is a discussion. It's a very important discussion, but it is not a discussion that is relevant to the current one. But I will pick the bit that is relevant to the current discussion and pose it to the entire panel. Rahul, I should say that when it comes to responses, you are included in the panel, so you are free to give your opinion as well. Please do. We would all be very keen to hear it. The question is, uh, what, if any, do you think may be the long-term consequences 
of the change in the status of Jammu and Kashmir by the government of India on this whole conflict and, and, and et cetera. There is also a related question from someone else, which says that the abrogation of uh, 370 and 35A, which are the articles of the Indian constitution that altered the status of Jammu and Kashmir and, and made uh, you know, the division into, into union territories, et cetera. Uh, does it render the Shimla agreement null and void? So these are two questions from two people. I've picked parts of it, the bits that I think are relevant and posed to you. It's posed to all of you. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will also tell you two other questions. These are all posed to all of you. Then there are questions for specific speakers, which I will then ask later. One is what is the influence of the Indus Water Treaty and, and the water, the, the, the river water agreement, you know, on, on all this, which, which is the second question. And the, the third is to the, to the entire panel is, I'm going to read this one out. Uh, how long will the meta narratives of Indian and Pakistani nationalism be used as a prism to see the Kashmir dispute? There are more. So these three are for all of you, Pallavi, it includes you. Uh, if I could request all of you to keep, stick to two, three minutes uh, for each question, and then we can get through these and, and more. Shall we start with you, Myra? Right, okay, difficult questions, but I'll try and answer them quickly. Um, Long-term consequences of the action, gov Indian government's actions in 2019. I mean, I would say that the one that didn't get enough attention at the time was the bifurcation, which was effectively an, another disaggregation of, of the state, of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, I mean, it had already been partitioned in, um, in 47 and 48. And then by separating it out further um, into Ladakh and then Jammu and Kashmir, I think India pretty much erased the existence of the state altogether, um, which to my mind leads to a, a likely um, scenario whereby eventually you would be looking at... Um, both India and Pakistan absorbing uh, their parts of the, the, the erstwhile princely state that they hold and that the uh, line of control becomes the international border, albeit ideally a soft one. I don't find that that unlikely given Pakistan's interest, as I mentioned to Gil on Gilgit Baltistan. I'm not entirely sure it's, 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 a, it's a satisfactory solution to uh, a region that we've had this conflict for decades over, uh, 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 you can argue whether it's artificial or not, but over a state that was created in 1846. I'm not entirely convinced that actually simply erasing it and splitting it into its constituent parts is really a sound base, basis for a solution, but I rather suspect that's the what direction it's going in. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to skip the does it render the Shimla agreement null and void. Um, I'd have to go back and reread the Shimla agreement and see if there's anything there that I think it, uh, it affects, but I'm not, don't think I can answer that on the hoof. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm glad somebody mentioned the Indus Water Treaty. Um, just to make two points. First of all, obviously that was 1862, if I remember rightly. Um, anyway, lo the point, my point being, if I even got the date wrong, long, long before anybody thought that Siachen would ever be a, a conflict zone. Um, and I mean, right up to Shimla, nobody thought that uh, Siachen would be a conflict zone because it wasn't referred to there in the Shimla agreement either. Um, but I would like to make one point just when we're talking about the rivers is that um, we probably, everyone should, when you're thinking about these things, uh, go and look at a map, look at the way these rivers flow. It is remarkable. I've seen, you know, the, the, the Shyok, the Indus River in both sides of the borders uh, are going from Tibet into Indian held Ladakh into, into Baltistan on the Pakistan side. And you do get a sense of the contradiction between this very territorial 
cartography focused idea of trying to set borders and the natural run of the land in which historically people moved freely across it and rivers moved freely across it. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that somehow if, you, if, if we think about this more constructively, you might actually see better ways of trying to come to imaginative settlements. I mean, rather as, for example, Manmohan Singh articulated years ago when he said, you know, we couldn't get, we, there could be no exchange of territory, but you could make borders irrelevant. And it's a, an idea that needs to be aimed for. Um, meta narratives of how long are the meta narratives of Pakistan and Indian nationalism going to be um, going to hold Kashmir hostage? If I understood that question right, um, I mean, I presume until such time as uh, both countries feel comfortable in their own skin and find a way of um, making making peace with each other in such a way that they don't. Um, as Farzana said, try and find their ident assert their identity by claiming claiming Kashmiris or Ladakhis or or the people of Gilgit, Baltistan, or indeed anywhere. Um, but I mean that's a long, long way away. Um, and I share Farzana's skepticism on that. I was just having been skeptical for quite a few years. I was just trying to inject a little note of hope in the India-Pakistan talks, but it's only a small one. Rosanna, would you like to speak? Yes, I'm. 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 Uh, I'm sorry. You know, uh, I, I. I keep surfacing as sort of the um, unreconstructed pessimist. Um, I. I. I do now and again uh, experience moments of optimism, but they are few and far between. Um, very quickly, the three questions. Uh, what, if any, effect uh, have the changes um, in Kashmir? Uh, what, what, what effect are these likely to have? I mean, um, looking at it again from, from Pakistan's point of view, I mean, clearly, uh, Pakistan, I mean, it's, it's now an open secret, was, was, was caught off guard by, by uh, the the changes uh, made uh, in, in Kashmir. And uh, both the military and uh, the political uh, establishment came in for uh, a lot of criticism uh, for not having anticipated uh, these moves by India to, uh, as it were, um, reorder uh, the arrangement uh, uh, in, in Kashmir. But I think if I mean, as 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 far as uh, as as Pakistan is now concerned, I think, I mean, it's 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 obviously not going to um, uh, to 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 just to say that you know it's it, it's a fait accompli that it must uh, acquiesce to. But I think the fact that it is uh, prepared to hold uh, talks. With um, with India um, on Kashmir and has not actually made uh, the um, the the revocation of three hundred and seventy uh, a condition of talks that has to be grounds for some kind of optimism. I think what what Pakistan has has made a point of saying is that it doesn't want the demography of Kashmir. To be changed, so one can sort of read that, uh, uh, you know, any way one wants by saying, well, you know, it's leaving, it's leaving the door open. Um, as far as the similar agreement is concerned, whether or not that was null and void, well, let me say that, you know, it, that agreement in 1972 uh, was one that Pakistan has always been very ambivalent about. Pakistan's official position. On Kashmir has always been, uh, you know, that it is an international issue, uh, and this is why it has always looked to international mediation. Uh, India, of course, holds a very different position that it is a bilateral, uh, a, a bilateral issue to be settled between India and Pakistan. And in a sense, the Simla Agreement was meant to formalise that. And I should remind our audience and and the panelists that um, you know uh, that agreement which was of course signed by Bhutto came in the wake 
of Pakistan's defeat uh, at the hands of, of India following the civil war uh, in Bangladesh in 1971. And after Bhutto signed that agreement uh, uh, in Simla, he came home and, and, and you know, virtually um, uh, reneged on that agreement. So, you know, in a sense, it, it, uh, that, that agreement is there, but, but, but Pakistan's own commitment to that agreement and its wider implications, uh, you know, uh, remain somewhat, somewhat hazy. Uh, as far as the meta narratives of, of uh, Indian and Pakistani nationalism uh, and and you know where that that takes us, well, I think my position uh, is 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 fairly clear. I think it's uh, it's 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 not something that is going to be resolved anytime soon. And as Myra said, uh, it will only come about uh, when both India and Pakistan feel comfortable about uh, on, on their own terms uh, with, their, with their respective national identities, rather than constantly seeking external validation for these identities. Thank you, Farzana. Pallavi, I'm going to ask you to speak now. Uh, you can keep your camera off because I know you have uh, internet connectivity problems. But before I ask you, Pallavi, I just wanted to say to someone in the audience who had asked precisely this question, which was that, you know, why is there no international mediation in this dispute? And, you know, why, would, would that not help? And so on and so forth. So I hope that question has been, which was for the entire panel, but I hope that question has been answered in, in what Razana has just said, which is that, 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 that the very, uh, you know, core and the basic sort of, uh, and, uh, you know, element of the Shimla agreement was that from India's side, that it was a bilateral issue and therefore needed to be sorted out bilaterally, whereas Pakistan has often uh, sought and, and, and considered and asked for international uh, mediation. Um, there is also a question, a minor question, uh, from someone who had asked another question about whether or not, uh, I'm trying to look at it quickly, uh, position of the Biden administration towards international talks to finally resolve Kashmir. Uh, I'm not posing this question, but for the benefit of the person who has asked, uh, we did discuss this in part along with other issues like Afghanistan, uh, India, Pakistan, other issues of Pakistan, including Gilgit Baltistan, uh, in the in the uh, uh, event that we did in February. Uh, Rahul is going to correct me on this. It was on the 13th of February, I think, which was called Different Stars, Different Stripes, which actually looked at the United States presence, uh, role and changing role in the dynamics of South Asian geopolitics and geostrategy. So please do refer to it. That recording is available um, on our website in the archives of our events, and there will be a working paper coming out of it um, soon. Um, Pallavi. I'm going to ask you to respond to the three questions. And I'm also, because of your internet connectivity, I'm also going to pose a question that has been posed directly to you, which you can also answer. But actually the question that is posed directly to Pallavi uh, has been asked in different ways by others in the audience and then posed to all of you together. Uh, I'm paraphrasing from three or four questions, but in the, the essential question is, where are the Kashmiris in this dispute? Where is their voice? Uh, where is the consideration of what they may want? Do they want to be Indian? Do they want to be Pakistani? Do they want to be on the Indian side? Do they want to be on the Pakistani side? Uh, you know, is there a, a question I'm trying to try? I want to use, use the words that uh, people have, uh, audiences have, have used. And there was someone who was, asking about Kashmiriyat, I beg your pardon, I can't find uh, the question, but there was a question of Jamhuriyat and Kashmiriyat and et cetera. So the, the, but the core thing in this, uh, Pallavi, it was uh, the first question was actually directed towards you, uh, said that, do you think the denial of agency to the Kashmiris as stakeholders for deciding their own territoriality uh, is um, important in, in this context? So Pallavi, would you like to take the first three questions and then answer the fourth one. And then I'll invite uh, Myra and Farzana to come back to the Kashmir, uh, the question about Kashmiris. Yeah, go for it, Pallavi. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Dilanjit. Sorry about my connection.
activity. I think, I mean, I did try turning it on earlier, but I think it's just safer if I, if I keep the uh, camera off. Uh, and thank you for the, you know, for the great questions. Um, you know, I'm, uh, rather than kind of uh, uh, replying to each one, I mean, one of the things I was thinking of, you know, uh, broadly was that it's interesting right now, you know, someone was saying to me earlier that, look, it's, it's, it's really interesting how the current government has gone and hijacked arguments about decolonization, you know, the process of decolonization, and has, uh, has tried to kind of, uh, you know, use those kinds of arguments uh, in its favor. And it's, you know, it, it, some of it does strike me, I mean, you know, I, uh, as it happens, have been teaching a course uh, you know, in the semester about decolonization, and I've been talking about these, you know, these these historians who sort of argue that look, post-colonial states, uh, they take a lot, you know, they they uh, the leadership kind of um, you know uh, uh, puts a lot of effort into making its their population uh, adhere around a boundary line that they inherited, you know, and uh, and uh, uh, moreover that these leadership they frequently. Uh, 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 you know, punish or 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 uh, you know, discriminate against uh, people who question the logic of these boundary lines and say that look, you know, these boundary lines are never drawn with our consent, or we don't belong. Uh, you know, we don't feel like these boundary lines have a uh, have a logic, or we feel that our identity is not reflected accurately by by the boundary lines that we've got. And uh, in in some ways, I suppose uh, there's you know, uh, you know, this kind of argument about the nature of decolonization and how um, many post-colonial leaders kind of defended their actions by saying that, look, we have to be like these uh, strong men uh, because we're trying to uh, we're trying to hold a, a, a country together. Uh, in some ways, uh, they're finding like a curious kind of salience in the present moment. Uh, but it's also sort of important to remember that, look, decolonization has many forms, you know, and it's not, uh, and, uh, and when you're uh, talking about how how do people really decolonize? You also have to recognize a variety of different, uh, you know, uh, ideas about administration and jurisdiction and sovereignty and, uh, you know, community uh, that, that that people carry with them. And uh, really decolonizing is about recognizing all of those different ideas of, of sovereignty as well, rather than trying to uh, forcibly uh, uh, stake your claim over a, you know, over a colonial a colonially drawn boundary line. So I think that kind of argument does have some kind of salience in, 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 in all the issues that we're looking at, whether it's about the Indus Water Treaty and how these rivers that kind of flow naturally were just made to adhere to the nation state's boundary lines, or the question about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kashmir and, uh, you know, what it's, what its recent status sort of implies. I mean, I think we also need to kind of look at it in terms of in terms of like a, in terms of like a, uh, you know, a, 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 what this presents to us as a, a, a from a, the, you know the broader arc of history as it as it as it were. But uh, sec lastly, I just want to say that look, all, a lot of this is also. Uh, 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 also really about a conversation about provincialism, provincial identities. And, you know, you, 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 you sort of brought, brought up phrases like Jamuria, you know, Jamuria or Punjabi. I mean, you know, uh, identities about community uh, that, uh, that kind of transcend the, the uh, present day idea of the nation state and, uh, you know, how people kind of adhere to provincial identities. Uh, they, they, they retain those provincial identities much more deeply sometimes than they do the, 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 that of the nation state. So I think it's, you know, when we're trying to look for like these alternative ideas about look, what, what is it that South Asian states ought to do? Uh, how should they kind of try to navigate the challenges that they're facing? I think they do need to look very carefully at all the alternative uh, ways of thinking about community and sovereignty that South Asia has had to offer rather than just thinking about it in terms of in only India and Pakistan from 1947 onwards. Thank you, um, Pallavi. That was that was great and very very succinct. Um, Myra, I, I saw you you responding with shaking your head to uh, to to what Pallavi was saying. Do you want to speak first and speak about the Kashmiriyat? I, I found the the quote which I've uh, there it is. It says, uh, which is the most important uh, to in your opinion, to maintain peace in the valley among amongst the three variables, which is Kashmiriyat, Insaniyat, and Jamhuriyat. 
Um, so, so that was really the exact question. Um, I couldn't find it then, my apologies to the person who asked. Uh, so Myra, would you like to speak? And then Farzana, if you'd like to speak. And then Farzana, um, there's a question specifically for you. Okay, let me preface this by saying I don't like to um, talk specifically about the mood in the valley. I haven't been there for a long time. Obviously, we're not allowed to travel right now, and I don't feel comfortable about commenting on what people think there without going and spending time there. Um, but one of the reasons I was nodding was that I rather loved that 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 reference from Pallavi about provincial identity because, you know, the thing about Kashmir is it's both on one hand too small and too too narrowly focused and and and, and not widely focused enough. Um, because there is a real problem with the fact that everything tends to focus in the Kashmir Valley. And it does tend to be quite provincial and it, it doesn't really look at the broader connections of either the other parts of um, Jammu and Kashmir as a princely state, in other words, Ladakh or Jammu or Gilgit or Baltistan, but also even at an even wider level. And I tried to sketch this a little bit in my book is that this is a region where connections have gone between um, between South, between that area between South and Central Asia, where you have seen connections between uh, between Tibet, between Chinese Central Asia, Xinjiang, Kashmir, um, Afghanistan, for centuries. <coughs> so I think we've ended up caught in a trap of being, <coughs> on one hand, very overly provincially focused, and then in turn being dominated by India and Pakistan, and then on top of that, completely ignoring the broader and natural interconnections of that region. Um, I don't know how that can be fixed because obviously, you know, the, the, the India and Pakistan are both like, you know, elephants fighting with trample on the grass. But, but I, I, and it's a bit chicken and egg from the Kashmiri perspective. I think there is no way to my mind that the Kashmir Valley alone can survive as an independent state. Um, it's not just about being sandwiched geographically between India and Pakistan, but it's also, it doesn't have the economic resources to do that. So, you know, it's also a question of, of Kashmir needing to develop a more uh, mature form of democratic politics that starts where people imagine for themselves other solutions. But I say that in full acknowledgement of the fact that both on the Indian side and indeed on the Pakistan side, both countries have have tended to crush any any real genuine democracy. So it is a chicken and egg. But ultimately, it seems to me that um, Kashmiris are going to have to reimagine their relationship in that region if they want to actually make progress, rather than waiting. Otherwise, what you're going to see, as I said earlier, uh, the LOC becomes the international border, and that's really the end of it. Thank you, Myra. Uh, Farzana, uh, please, please do speak about the Kashmir issue, but let me also pose the question that is directly posed to you so you can answer the two together. Uh, the question that uh, is, is, is directly for you is, I'm going to read the question out. Do you think that the pulling out of US troops from Afghanistan uh, will have an impact on the Kashmir conflict? So if you speak- uh, Okay, the let me- um... Let me let me deal very quickly with with, with pulling out of um, sure, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Afghanistan. Um, well, I I am not I'm not exactly sure that we know how this is going to play out when it comes to the Kashmir issue. But I but I do believe that Pakistan has always looked. To the United States uh, to, 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 to step in in some kind of um, mediatory uh, capacity. And Pakistan is aware that if uh, the United States uh, is going to rely increasingly on, on India to, to, to try and, um, as it were, realize uh, its, its, its China policy, by which I mean in some sense containing China, then there has to be some kind of stability in relations between India and Pakistan. India cannot 
continue to be to be distracted, as it were, by its conflict with Pakistan. So, uh, in, in in that sense, I think Pakistan feels that you know it is also in the interest of the United States uh, to try and uh, to tr to try and um, well, not mediate directly, but certainly press on both parties uh, to, to to talk to each other and uh, to to resume dialogue. We'll just have to wait and see how that 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 pans out. Um, but I think when it comes to the whole question of uh, of, uh, of of Kashmir and 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 uh, Kashmiriyat and you know um, the Kashmiris themselves. Well, I think you know we're all pretty much agreed on this panel uh, that you know the Kashmiris are pawns and have been pawns uh, between India and Pakistan. Well, since uh, since the two states became independent uh, in uh, in 1947, I think there is. There is a, a, a problem, and I think Myra uh, touched uh, upon it uh, in her presentation, but also in her book that, you know, when we think of Kashmir, we tend, uh, you know, automatically to think of the valley. But in fact, of course, there's Jammu and there's Ladakh. And it's by no means obvious that the Hindu population of Jammu uh, in the event, unlikely event, that you know some kind of agreement is reached over Kashmir is going to voluntarily agree to join Pakistan. And from what I understand, reading uh, Myra is that the Buddhist uh, population in Ladakh have always deeply resented being lumped in, as it were, with with the the two other parts uh, of, of Kashmir uh, and and their populations. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that you know we talk about Kashmir as if it was some kind of broadly homogeneous entity, which it patently is not. It is culturally diverse. It is extremely heterogeneous, and so. I think really what the, the only way forward uh, is, and, and Myra touched on it, and it has, of course, as we know, under Musharraf being broached much more seriously, and that is really one of, of having soft borders. Uh, so as to allow uh, Kashmiris to, 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 to live uh, with, with, the kind of, uh, with the kind of autonomy uh, that, uh, that, that they aspire. Uh, that they aspire to, because having a hard border along the LOC is, to my mind, a, a, a recipe for conflict. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we are getting to the end of uh, our event in terms of time, uh, but there are a couple of other things. Uh, one is a comment that I'll read out uh, because it's relevant, and one is a question about China uh, which is, is, is relevant, definitely. The comment, um, Farzana, this was in response to your um, response that, you know, we don't really quite know how the withdrawal of US troops is really going to pan out in the region and et cetera, is that one, when one looks at the region historically, uh, it is possible to say that the withdrawal of Soviet troops did leave an impact and any kind of such withdrawal is bound to have an impact. Of course, your point is very well made, which is that impact there will be, what we don't know is what that impact will be and you know, how it will uh, manifest itself. The question on China is, is this, and this is for everyone on the panel, the question on China is this, that is it given the, you know, uh, uh, the, the hostile uh, relations uh, between China and India, it, alongside China's um, relations with with Pakistan? Um, why does China not come out openly in favor of Pakistan and supporting Pakistan's position on uh, Kashmir? Is it because? Uh, China is concerned about uh, the question of Tibet and India's role in it. Uh, Farzana, do you want to go first? Should we go the, the other way now? Do you want to go first? And then Myra and then Pallavi? Yes, I'm, um, I'm aware that, 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 that we're running too short of time. But let me just say that, uh, you know, um, when, when um, uh, India made its moves with regard to Article 370 and 35A, uh, China did 
uh, did voice uh, quite quite strong criticism um, uh, and 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 and, base, and, and criticised uh, India's actions uh, as uh, as uh, as unwarranted. Um, China's stance. Uh, on on Kashmir, which in Pakistan is read, of course, as siding uh, with Pakistan, has become uh, become uh, much stronger. I would say in the last uh, three or four years, this was not always the case, as we know, both in 1965 and 1971, China adopted an extremely um, ambivalent, ambivalent position uh, in the conflict uh, between uh, uh, India and Pakistan. A fact that that you know Pakistan has generally not wanted to, to to acknowledge, but the fact remains that there was very little moral and material support uh, for Pakistan during those uh, those conflicts. Um, was there a second point about China, or was was that it? No, the point was connected, which was that is the position of, is China not, uh, I mean, it's it's understandable what you're saying that uh, whatever China does, howsoever it does it in Pakistan is read as uh, China supporting Pakistan's position. But the question was that China is not openly doing so. Uh, and is the concern from China's side that India might sort of, you know, play the, the Tibet card as the question question says. That, that was the connected question. Right, well, shall I respond or shall I leave? Yeah, no, 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 go, go ahead, go ahead, why don't you finish? And then we just take, uh, ask uh, Myra and Pallavi to speak and then I'll invite all of you for closing remarks. Well, obviously, obviously there, 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 there is a concern on, on the part of, uh, of China not to unnecessarily antagonize uh, South Asia's uh, biggest power. There's, there, there's no doubt about that. But, uh, you know, as we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, China will flex its muscles and adopt a more aggressive stance uh, if it believes that the situation uh, lends itself uh, to, to China's advantage. So I think, you know, we, we have to just, we have to leave it uh, as, as that. Uh, I don't think uh, at the moment China is overly concerned about any move it makes being damaging to uh, its interests uh, in Tibet. I mean, that that conflict has been there uh, a long time. I think it's it, it's much more worried about, you know, how this 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 sort of recently volatile relationship with with um, with India will play out in in the South Asian region itself. Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Myra, would you like to? Um, yeah, I would just, I mean, a little bit, I mean, I agree on the whole with Farzana, I guess I because my focus is very much on Ladakh, um, I would say we need to be a little bit wary of thinking too much, is China reacting to Indian moves in Kashmir, or is China reacting to Indian moves in Ladakh? And it did strike me at the time in, in 2019, it was particularly critical of, 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 of India bifurcating Ladakh and effectively building it up as a, a platform that could potentially be used against China. Um, and India, to my mind, with a bit of overreach, you know, made a point of saying that they were going to reclaim the Aksai Chin. There were some even said they were going to reclaim Gilgit Baltistan, both of which then you're looking at a direct threat to Chinese interests. Um, I mean, Gilgit Baltistan, because that's where uh, CPEC runs through, Aksai Chin, um, because that is its main link between Xinjiang and Tibet. So I think, of course, all these things get, get, get thrown around together in the mix, but, but I think we need to be careful, and particularly for those of us who are more South Asian experts, to be careful not to get too drawn into into how it looks from Srinagar or from the Kashmir Valley, and and actually, and we're all going to have to get better at deferring to um, Chinese experts who can give us a little bit of a better handle on places like Xinjiang and, and Tibet. Um, I mean, the whole reason India and China ended up fighting a war in '62 was because China built a road between Xinjiang and Tibet. 
I just I know we're short of time, but I just say there's a couple of wild cards in there right. that I'm competent to, 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 to comment on, but I do think it's something we need to pursue is um, the intensity of the Chinese crackdown in Xinjiang, which has in turn led to serious Western anxieties about human rights abuses. And the other one, I guess, just to flag up, we're going to see the succession to the Dalai Lama at some point. It's obviously one that needs to be watched. Um, but again, it's you need to find experts on these, each of these areas to start beginning to untangle it all. I'm sure our series will have occasion and space to consider those as well. Thank you for the ideas. Uh, Pallavi, would you like to uh, respond? Um, I'm only going to respond very briefly because this particular question, you know, really, I'm 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 not the best person to to you know the, to uh, to answer in a in a in a lot of detail. But it's just, I mean, I, I think I should end by just reiterating what I was saying earlier about how you know we also need to think about how we can find uh, different models of how states ought to act when they're trying to consolidate themselves and when they're trying to kind of you know uh, 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 trying to kind of uh, build a coherent sense of territory you know and uh, the, the, the sorts of things that they do uh, in order to 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 have a clearer uh, uh, you know boundary and have a clearer kind of uh, you know a uh, 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 a shape. I mean, I think, uh, you, you know, the, uh, and the, the kinds of atrocities that they commit along the way of doing that. I mean, I think that that that's, you know, you, you have to question that further by bringing into the conversation more uh, other ideas about how governance and administration and, you know, uh, jurisdiction ought to Ought to be done, and to do that, you have to kind of draw on older histories of 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 uh, you know of sovereignty, uh, and kind of bring in like uh, you know nineteenth century or eighteenth century histories of of uh, you know or that kind of uh, that kind of go beyond the present day idea of the nation state. I mean, I think you have to use those more creatively, so that there's you know there's there's the states of South Asia as they are today are you know are uh, have greater room to be more accommodative of their people and not restrict them by kind of imposing artificially drawn boundary lines. I think I'll, I mean I, I'm just going to say that much, but not get into the uh, minutiae of the question. That sure. Would you like to say something just by way of closing remarks because we're going to wrap up now? Uh... Um, is this? to me sorry Pal yeah Pallavi, sorry it was to you oh yeah no uh, i i think I'm, I, I'm i'm done i'm gonna open i mean i'm gonna leave, leave it to myra and farzana and, and, and rahul and just say again you know thank you very much again for for having me on on my on this panel and apologies again about my internet connection no not at all uh farzana you need to you need to unmute yourself I've said uh, pretty much what I wanted to say. I think you know it's 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 been a very rich and uh, and instructive discussion, and I I just hope that the audience um, um, feel that as well. Um, thank you, uh, Myra. Is there anything that uh, we did not give you a chance to to say that you would really like to say? I know it's very hard to summarize a book in in a very short while. Our apologies for that, but please do. Uh, say something that you may want to say. Okay, well, just very briefly, I, I, I'd just like to say I, I couldn't endorse more of Pallavi's comments about how we need to find different different models of how states draw their borders um, and reimagine it and reconsider history and, and, and try and get away from this notion of, 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 you know, I think it was Maxwell, the historian of the India-China war, who said that, that you know, in India had made, and Pakistan had made borders become the cell walls of their national identity. And that really has to be challenged. Um, but I, I guess I think what we're going to have to do is move on two tracks, because on one hand, you need a big picture reimagining of the nature of the connections in that part of the world. Um, on the other, you have a very immediate problem that needs to be addressed. And so I, I would urge people to read the book, obviously. But I just, I, I guess I would say, given all the multiple overlapping conflicts and given that the challenges of reimagining how uh, post-colonial states imagine their borders, I would 
I guess I would say one thing to keep in mind is do no harm. And nobody, and especially not the United States or any others, should imagine that there is some easy way where you come in with a lot of muscle and you solve this because actually you're looking at at everything from from tactical frontier, challenge frontiers to big, big, big contestations and um, people who are unhappy with the way they're being governed. So it needs, as I said, some up care and patience and thoroughness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sakar. I mean, there is a, a lot uh, really uh, to take away from Myra's book and the discussion that we've had. But from a, a policy analysis sort of perspective, uh, there are two things that have struck me uh, most. Uh, the first is the, uh, the, the possibility of Siachen as a trigger uh, for a larger or, or the start or the expansion of uh, uh, greater tensions and uh, towards uh, conflict between India and Pakistan. I think that's something that needs to be watched very carefully and possibly we've been ignoring what uh, has been going on uh, in Siachen and the broad and the larger and the dark area. So I think uh, Siachen as a trigger, I think is very important. The second uh, concept that is very important, I think is what Myra said at the right at the beginning, and I'd alluded to it, is the uh, interlinked and overlapping nature of the conflict uh, in, in the Himalayan region. Uh, this is something that uh, clearly in the last year and a few months has become more potent uh, especially in relation to the India-China, uh, uh, growing India-China tensions. And this is another takeaway, really, that we, we need to look at this uh, in sort of in a much larger geopolitical and geostrategic context uh, than we have done ever before uh, because of the new tensions that have taken place uh, in, in the region. So uh, I think these are two uh, policy-relevant uh, perspectives uh, that have come out and I think that are very important for policy analysts in South Asia and around the world to follow very closely. So I'd like to thank uh, really the panelists uh, for providing this perspective. Thank you very much, Rahul. It is, uh, this, this has been absolutely great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this, the recording for this will be available on, on our uh, events archive page from tomorrow in the morning. Uh, but uh, I don't want to end this without uh, thanking, uh, especially Myra who agreed um, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I, was, I did not know Myra from before, who agreed to, to uh, discuss the book uh, at our event, for which we are very, very grateful. May I also take this opportunity to thank Myra's publishers, Hearst Publishers, who were very generous in allowing us to circulate uh, PDFs of the book for, to the panelists, uh, which, which really helps very much. So, so my gratitude to them as well. Having worked in publishing, I'm very well aware of, of how these things work. So thank you very much, uh, Hearst. And uh, thank you, Farzana, very much for your time, for always being so supportive and agreeing. Thank you, Pallavi Raghavan. It was a pleasure to know you virtually. We've never met, uh, but thank you for your contribution. And Rahul, last but not the least, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we, uh, this has been yet another very enjoyable and successful event of ours. Thank you to the audience. And uh, we will be back, I hope, with, with a new uh, suite of events in, in the new academic year. This is the last event for this academic year. Um, but uh, with that, thank you, everyone. Goodbye. And we hope that uh, these discussions will continue. And I sincerely hope, going back to what uh, Myra said at the beginning, we know that India in particular, yes, but all the other countries uh, at the moment are going through a very, very difficult time with regards to the COVID pandemic. The, the, uh, rates of uh, the increase in infection in, in Nepal, in Bangladesh in the last two days have been absolutely uh, horrific, frankly. Uh, and, and we know that it is also spreading in, in Sri Lanka and in Pakistan. So we hope sincerely, we all feel we are all very disturbed. We're all consumed by, uh, by what is happening. Uh, the center, the South Asia Center has sent out a message today of support to, to all our friends uh, for this reason. Uh, Pallavi, you are in the thick of it in, in Delhi in, uh, and close to Delhi. Um, but we hope that all of us will come out of this uh, with the least amount of harm. And uh, we also hope, all of us, we also hope that uh, there will sooner or later be a resolution um, to, to the Pakistan question. 
and and India and Pakistan uh, to the to the Kashmir question. I beg your pardon. And India and Pakistan uh, will will have many other more friendly things to talk about. On that note, thank you everyone and goodbye. Thank you.